Hello everyone, welcome to Rural Water Resource Management NPTEL course, week 4, lecture 5. So this will be the last lecture for week 4. And so we will do a short recap to some materials in groundwater. First, let's look at the statistics for water resources in India. We have gone through this in the initial classes where we looked at the annual water availability as in billion cubic meters per year. We have around 1800 uh, or 1900 close to uh, billion cubic meters uh, of which usable is only uh, 1100 or 1123 billion cubic meters of which surface water is 690 and groundwater has a very good share of 433. So what this clearly tells you is that of the usable water, 433 billion cubic meter is supplied by groundwater. So given all the rainfall, the storage, the big dams, still the groundwater usage is a very considerable amount in the annual groundwater use in India. It is also a very decentralized water wherein you don't need a channel, you don't need a dam to store and then do it, but everyone who has access to wells and pumps can locally source the water. So uh, because of the ease, because of the access uh, and technology, uh, the stress on this water has also increased. And it's been captured by different groundwater maps, uh, especially the pre-monsoon, because that is the peak summer. So after all the rainfall, after all the recharge happens, you extract water and it is reflected in the pre-monsoon season maps. So if you look at 2014 uh, and you could see that the pre-monsoon levels are really uh, concerning in central India, where it goes to five to 10 meters, um, the yellow color and pink color, 10 to 20 meters, but most importantly, Rajasthan, Punjab, uh, Haryana, those regions have uh, drastic groundwater uh, levels depleted. The levels are ongoingly depleted and you know that what is the key livelihoods in those regions is mostly livelihoods are supported by agricultural activities. So agriculture has been a biggest consumer of groundwater uh, and uh, annually uh, the water levels are decreasing in these regions. So it is not uh, that, uh, okay, you deplete it and then it comes back again annually, but it's not. So th there has to be some measures, some stringent rules on groundwater use and abuse um, and more uh, progressive thinking on groundwater. Also, a lot of people react later, very, very uh, late. So uh, by that time, groundwater depletion has hit a level that it is uh, almost irreversible. So it is more proactive, measures are needed, um, wherein um, visualizing the groundwater use, visualizing the groundwater demand, we need to understand and develop methodologies that can recharge faster or limit the use of groundwater. Let's look at a table of comparisons at the top level. And as I mentioned earlier, Central Groundwater Board characterizes the blocks as safe, semi-critical, critical, and over-exploited based on the groundwater use. If they use zero to 70% of the annual recharge, it is, you can still use some water and 30% could be given to ecosystem services, base flow, stream flow generation, etc. 70 to 90% is semi-critical uh, and anywhere 90 to 100%, which means you're using the annual replenishable water in the groundwater every year, uh, you using it. So think about your bank account analogy again. Uh, if you have 1000 rupees coming in uh, or 10,000 rupees coming in per month as a salary and by the end of the day, end of the month, uh, if you have zero balance, then that is critical because if anything happens, you don't have water, you don't have money. Uh, but 70, 90% is semi-critical, zero to 70% is safe. Over 100%, which means you are using 
a past recharged water or someone else's water. So that means it is over exploited. So that is the concern. So over exploited is a concern and critical is also a big concern because critical stages can easily jump into the over exploited. So think about a bank account. You have 10,000 coming in every month and at the last day of the month, if you say, no, I need more, uh, I've, I've exhausted my 10,000 rupees, I use a credit card or a loan and I take more, it adds up as a debt, okay? So you are actually eating into your future water or you're taking some savings and then using uh, your, your water. So uh, over exploitation is bad. If you know the water levels, why would you go and um, is, uh, use more water is the question. If you know you're going to get 10,000, you should have your demands and also your needs within the 10,000 so that you are safe. Otherwise, it is overexploited. And that is not sustainable. How long can you do that? At one point, you need to stop. Maybe you will say, okay, I won't spend after some time, I'll stop, but water is not that. Every year you need water. Every year the trees need water. Every year the streams need base flow. So over-exploitation and critical stages are very, very important and groundwater board and government agencies are working on arresting these groundwater uh, falling levels by putting in more infrastructures or mapping them for the, for the government records and sensitizing people on not doing these kind of activities. The rules and regulations are not yet stringent because it is very hard to understand where the pumping is, who are pumping, et cetera, et cetera. So zero to 70% areas have uh, groundwater potential for development. So you still can extract more. And if you look across the uh, years from 1995 to 2011, the percentage of districts in the past 20 years um, um, shows clearly that the safe level blocks and districts have come down from 92 to 71. Okay, so look at 1995, it was 92 districts were safe, 2011, 71, which means your safe districts are coming down, whereas your over exploited and critical are increasing, especially your over exploited, which was three, it jumped to 14, 14, and 15. So within um, uh, 10 years, you have a 14 um, districts uh, over exploited. Same in the critical stage, also one, four, four, four. So what you see clearly is the safe and semi-critical have been converted as critical and over exploited. So this is why uh, I'm trying to say that critical blocks, critical districts have to be managed with utmost care because they can any day become over exploited. Let's look at how it looks now compared to 2011 images. So in 2011 images, you saw a lot of green color here. Let's go back and show you quickly. So you saw a lot of green color, which is two to five meters depth uh, to the water level, which is still safe. Uh, and uh, five to 10, 10 to 20 are really bad. Blues are okay. But when you come to 20, 2019, which is the latest 2020, image, you see clearly that, okay, the borders of the green are still, but the central India is actually coming in groundwater levels. It is the same legend, so the coloring is the same. So two to five, which were here, all the green colors, all the green colors along this region, central India, are now in the 10 to 20, not even five to 10. So you have jumped approximately 15 meters. Uh, from your 2011 level. So within eight years or even nine to 10 years, uh, your groundwater has fallen by 15 meters and that is not sustainable. Multiply it by the area, you would understand how much volume that is, which is very, very big compared to the water volume available. Let's see which other uh, states, you saw the districts, now let's see other states that are using uh, very high amounts of groundwater uh, as percent development. Uh, and I said anything above 100 is bad, but we'll still put a ballpark around 90%, which is critical. So 90 and above is not acceptable because it's 
very, very um, harmful to the groundwater aquifer. So you can come down to Delhi. Delhi's water is groundwater levels are above the recharge. So the use is above the recharge and um, um, uh, st the government is working on a lot of uh, methods to bring back the water by recharge and other mechanisms, but the population is very high. So there's a lot of um, groundwater use. Coming to Haryana, which is an agricultural state, you could see the groundwater use is above your groundwater recharge because 100 is equal, groundwater recharge is equal to groundwater uh, use, but here is 133, so 33% above. And uh, when you come down another 90 is Puducherry, a very small state. Um, there's a lot of agricultural activities there and also uh, urbanization. Punjab is purely driven by agriculture and you could see a lot of agricultural activities uh, supported by groundwater. So groundwater has to be managed as, as much as in Rajasthan um, and other uh, states. So uh, all these states in 2011 um, uh, have performed kind of on the critical or semi-critical levels and there the are a handful which are on the over-exploited. But in recent years, uh, the, the levels are not promising because everyone is now uh, having easy access to groundwater. And so uh, these are the characterizations of the blocks of semi-critical, say, critical and over-exploited. Over-exploited are in the red colors. Uh, and you could see uh, in 2011, um, most of it is in uh, Haryana, Punjab, Rajasthan. Uh, there are some blocks. So compared to district, there are some blocks. So within the district, uh, the, the image might not be that helpful. Because, uh, part of the district uh, is urban. Part of the district might be a desert. Part of the district might be a forest. So overall, averaging of a district might not be that helpful. But a block image actually shows you where the water is being used more than the recharge and now you could see more southern states uh, have blocks that have uh, high demand in groundwater bangalore chennai uh, all the big cities are there hyderabad etc etc the reasons okay leave the urban reasons let's look at the uh, big big states and big bigger blocks what is the reason it is agriculture so increase in groundwater utilization for irrigation has tremendously increased over the years. If you look at the agricultural statistics 2014, uh, you could see that uh, the groundwater component in agriculture has increased from 30% to 60%, whereas the surface water has come from 60% to 30%. So almost it is exchanging their responsibilities. So now groundwater uh, has been uh, promoted as the key resource in those regions where surface water irrigation was happening. And that, again, as I said, surface water is a more centralized approach where you have a dam and the dam releases water to uh, farm farmlands, only to the farmlands where it has access to channels, whereas groundwater is you just have to put in a pump and then uh, suck all the water out. So coming back, so groundwater has overtaken uh, surface water in some regions, but more importantly, the pattern is exchanging between themselves. So the role, the responsibilities have been taken up by groundwater uh, and more and more areas are coming under groundwater irrigation. The other figure shows another story. Tumors have been increasing because uh, so that actually uh, is an indicator of uh, groundwater being the source of irrigation. So if you look at the source of irrigation, uh, canals which are surface water related uh, have almost stagnated from 1950s to 2010-11. Uh, tanks also as a surface water storage unit has also stopped or even come down in recent years, uh, whereas wells have increased and most importantly, your tube wells have just skyrocketed, okay? It was zero. It was zero in the 1950s, 1960s. Technology was expensive. Uh, there was not much development on groundwater uh, pumps, but then slowly science and technologies have become um, prolonged uh, effort 
in bringing up the groundwater pumps, electric pumps, diesel pumps, those kind of things. And uh, you could see uh, skyrocketing increase in the number of tube wells. Even the easy access and easy installation of tube wells has a big impact on the groundwater use for irrigation. So all this is not sustainable. Uh, because uh, initially one uh, village would have two, three wells. Uh, I could imagine in my uh, younger age, when I was traveling in the villages, you could see only certain number of wells for irrigation, but now every small plot has its own well, okay? because uh, there are some funds, there are some subsidies given, and uh, water is just being exhausted. But there is less and less groundwater recharge activities happening. Okay? So how, when, and why? What is the reason for this tremendous increase? Because uh, there is a lot of stress on farmers to produce more food. The population ever, ever is, is ever increasing. Uh, and the weight falls on the farmer's shoulders because they have to feed the and also, uh, if they cannot allow the land to go fallow because of the te technologies and so they would just put in more and more crops, fertilizers. Uh, all these things have actually converted the land from a single crop rotation land into uh, two or even three crop rotation lands. Uh, and with this rotation, there's more need of water and groundwater is being used because always you don't have rainfall for your Karif season. Because of this, uh, compared to your 2011, you will see more and more red blocks over okay, especially in the north uh, northern regions. Uh, but I would say that the ground reality might be much, much different because uh, if you go back to the issues and concerns I mentioned for groundwater monitoring, uh, some of the wells are not representative or some of the wells are not pumping wells. It is monitoring wells. And if you come to your central part of India, this is where we tie up all their learnings from these two lectures uh, on groundwater hydrology, what did we find in the central part of India? It is sort of hard rock aquifers. Uh, and hard rock aquifers uh, are not well connected because it has fractures. Um, and some of the wells would not be re replying together. You know, it, it won't tell the same story. So if you have one well, which is pumped for farming and right next to it, a well, which is not being pumped, the water level will be always the same. So when you do a block estimation, you, are, you might be misguided. So there is a more more uh, need for augmenting groundwater data with other data to understand the reality of groundwater use. So if you look at the papers and other things that will be shown in the case study approach uh, in the following lectures, you'll see remote sensing images and also land use land cover use uh, data, all these combining to give a groundwater estimate, not just a groundwater level. Okay? Because at the end of the day, if you have a, a land full of crops in a non-rainfall season, how did the crop grow? you should have given groundwater, right? So that is where you link groundwater level with rainfall, with your land use and cover change to understand what is the reality on the groundwater. So with this, let's do a recap of week four. Uh, we did um, do a very focused uh, discussion and uh, learning on groundwater hydrology, where we focused on the overall hydrology only the components which are necessary for groundwater hydrology. Uh, we looked at the most important components of precipitation, infiltration, percolation, um, and then uh, how water moves down in the soil profile to different uh, compartments in the aquifers, etc. We also looked at the uh, very important material and material properties uh, for groundwater hydrology, which is basically your sediment and uh, soil materials, along with the porosity, the pore space where water can enter and store. So these components, we uh, looked at many illustrations uh, and we understood that uh, if there is a confining unit or a impervious layer in between the aquifers, then the aquifer is divided as an unconfined and confined aquifer. 
the unconfined aquifers have the top surface the open to infiltration precipitation coming in whereas the unconfined are having a confining unit both on the top and the bottom so any system can have only one unconfined aquifer but the um, confined aquifers can be multiple and depending on the placement of your wells and the depth of the wells the wells get different names right so if you put a well in your shallow aquifer you will mostly be a dug well or you will have a well with a 30 meter depth uh, so it is annually recharged okay? shallow aquifers are annually recharged uh, or even within a couple of years, we looked at residence times, we looked at recharge uh, times, etc. when we discussed about aquifers. When we have deeper aquifers, this is the bigger concern, your deeper aquifers are going deep into the system, like here, and it is screened, so it doesn't take water from the shallow aquifers, it takes only from the deep aquifers, and uh, you are using water which has been uh, stored there or taken time around 100 years or even a millennia, 1000 years for the water to come there. So if you deplete it, uh, you will have to wait another 100 years for the full aquifer recharge to happen, which is not possible in one's lifetime. So uh, with utmost care and concern, aquifers should be used, especially the deep aquifers. If the shallow aquifers are depleted, then multiple opportunities are there to enhance the groundwater recharge, which we'll be looking at in the coming weeks. Uh, but more importantly, we will be looking at how uh, water structures, both natural and artificial, can aid in groundwater and uh, surface water hydrology for rural development. We also looked at zone of aeration versus zone of saturation, where a zone where it has uh, the, the soil is, has poor spaces still uh, without water or void spaces without water are called zone of aeration because air is still present. Whereas zone of saturation is the zone where the void spaces are filled up with water. Okay. So all these things we looked at, and we looked at the sloping nature of the land, which helps in groundwater movement uh, laterally. And we also discussed the stage where your groundwater recharge happens and it goes until your last impervious layer, which is your aquilud, aquitad, or your bedrock. And after that water, even though gravity is acting on it, water does not move down, but laterally. And once it goes laterally, there is a natural discharge. So discharge can happen in multiple ways. You can put a pump and take the water out. That is your uh, artificial discharge. But natural discharge is when groundwater goes and at one point comes out of your lithology or the earth's crust uh, into the streams, rivers, or springs. We also looked at perched water table, which is very less in number. Uh, and artesian wells, which are less in number, and what are the reasons through which it happens? We looked at central groundwater board data, how it's collected, and other measurement devices. Uh, and the driving force here is the data is present, but to have more understanding and more management plans, there is a need for augmenting these observation data with remote sensing and other data like farmer crop data yield data etc or even power use for groundwater pumps to estimate the amount of time the pump was running which is also related to the amount of water it was uh, pumping out from the aquifer so all these data can be put together to better understand groundwater block characterizations which is critical and semi-critical etc so with this, I'd like to conclude the groundwater hydrology lecture and look forward to meeting you in week five. Thank you.